Russian airborne troops seized control of the Gostomel airfield, an airbase in the northern outskirts of the capital, Kiev. But Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, vowed that they would be encircled and crushed. The airfield is located just 38 kilometers away from the center of the capital. Located alongside the airfield is the Antonov Airport. This is Ukraine's most important international cargo airport, as well as a key military airbase. It is also the base of the world's largest cargo plane, the AN-225. The fighting there is the closest that Russian forces have gotten to the capital on the first day of the invasion. Eyewitness accounts saying that two fighter jets had fired missiles at the Ukrainian ground units as the assault got underway. Smoke was seen rising from the scene. Images appear to show an assault by helicopter-borne troops. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry says the country's military has destroyed 74 Ukrainian military facilities, including 11 air bases. With us on the broadcast for more perspectives is Nicholas Grossman, an international relations professor at the University of Illinois and the senior editor of uh, ARC Digital. Thanks uh, very much for uh, being here with us. Uh, get us up to speed with your assessment of uh, how the West has responded to this Russian full-scale attack on Ukraine. Uh, we've seen a series of uh, statements, condemnation, pledges of support, but how far will they go? to prevent uh, further escalation on the ground? How far will the West go is a really important question. So far, they have followed a unusual strategy of disclosing a lot of Russian moves in advance, of revealing intelligence whenever they thought that Russia was lying, trying to stage a false flag, uh, offering false rationales, or even planning something that they weren't admitting. That, of course, did not end up deterring the invasion sufficiently. Also, what the West has done is spend a lot of both money and effort giving weapons to the Ukrainians, including things like Javelin anti-tank missiles. And those are something that seem to be making at least some of a difference in the fighting on the ground, making it more difficult for Russia to advance. However, the Russian military is decently stronger than uh, the Ukrainian military and will almost certainly be able to uh, achieve its immediate military goals, perhaps not larger political goals, but immediate military goals. And so the West is now thinking about not just with sending a signal to Russia, but also sending a signal to potential future aggressors, whether that is in Russia or perhaps, say, China with Taiwan. So mostly the West has tried to organize a lot of large economic penalties of sanctions that we can already see taking effect in the Russian stock market had its worst day since the 2008 financial crisis. The Russian ruble is crashing. Um, and uh, there is at least talk among uh, Western capitals of potentially trying to crack down on a lot of individual Russians, such as, for example, Russian oligarchs who have some, uh, say, high-end real estate in places like London or New York, perhaps with laundered money, you know, or Miami or a variety of other cities. Um, and we will see if the West really follows through on its harsh sanctions threat to really go all the way, because that will have economic blowback elsewhere too, including in their own countries. Right. Speaking of that, uh, how effective will sanctions be, even if they are tougher measures? Uh, we are expecting the U.S. president to announce a fresh set in just a short while from now, but how effective will sanctions be anymore? At first, sanctions probably won't do anything to change Russia's behavior. They seem pretty intent on a full-out military assault against Ukraine, of most likely aimed at some sort of regime change, perhaps installing a pro-Russian puppet in the government, um, as opposed to what we were hoping was maybe uh, more limited aims of just uh, fighting in the eastern parts of Ukraine that had declared their own independence that Ukraine was rejecting. Um, so. The Russian military probably won't be stopped. Uh, it, um, however, will do a lot of damage to the Russian economy. That might create pressure on Putin, on his inner circle, um, and will also send a signal to others in the future when they look back on this and say uh, either, oh, wow, that really worked out for Russia, we should do something like that too, or with all those penalties that Russia suffered, it ended up not being worth it in the end. But that's also much more long-term. Short-term, sanctions can't really do anything besides make Russia feel a degree of punishment for its actions. Right. Uh, Nicholas, let's also talk about uh, 
uh, the statements that we have already seen coming in, what meaning do the pledges of support and the statements of condemnation have uh, now that the Russian attack is already underway? So the statements are pretty much a statement of principle and not all that much more. They're also a signal of critics of Russia's actions, of opponents of Russia's actions, signals to each other that they are trying to muster the will for a harsh response. Russia is most likely gambling that uh, the West and other advanced economies who can add, for example, Japan has imposed some pretty strict sanctions already, um, that these uh, international community will end up wimping out, that they will ultimately decide, you know, we are not willing to take the damage to our economies of going really full out with these sanctions. Maybe uh, the West will do it at first, but Russia is gambling that they will lose interest, you know, maybe in a few months, maybe in a year or two. Um, and decide that they would rather make more money. So the statements are not going to stop the Russian military from invading. Uh, they unfortunately are not going to stop a lot of death and suffering inside Ukraine. Um, but what they are doing is making a statement of principle and working towards trying to have a unified response. Right, uh, now that the Russian attack has uh, happened and despite those warnings and threats and sanctions coming in from the West. What is your assessment of the potential of the NATO, the European Union, the United States to protect Ukraine as of now? Well, NATO and the United States um, are not really trying to protect Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is not in NATO, which means that um, it is not the US and say the UK, France, other countries are not under any sort of treaty obligation to defend Ukraine. And the unfortunate reality is Russia cares more about Ukraine than uh, the United States does and that NATO does as a whole. And this is something that everybody knows. It's a factor of geography and history more than anything else. And since everybody knows that NATO cares less about Ukraine than Russia does, then NATO is not willing to go to war over Ukraine. I would personally not advise being uh, willing to risk starting World War III over Ukraine. And so while, for example, US President Joe Biden has been very clear that the United States will defend any NATO country, so think uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, um, anyone that is in Eastern Europe or elsewhere and possibly menaced by Russia, but since they are not obligated to defend Ukraine, and since they would not be able to militarily defend Ukraine without a really large scale direct war against Russia, which could risk nuclear war, they're not going to try. The Ukrainians, when it comes to the actual fighting, the Ukrainians are on their own. The most that outside countries are going to do is uh, provide them with weaponry, provide them with uh, economic support where they can, potentially humanitarian assistance where they can, rhetorical support, certainly uh, internationally. Um, it's probably safe to assume that some covert intelligence officers of foreign countries are on the ground trying to push things a little in a favorable direction, but their ability will be limited. The dominant force there by a lot is the Russian military and they're going to be able to dictate outcomes more than others. Right, so what could the West have done differently according to you or have they done their best in your view? I think the West has done pretty well that um, if, especially in the short term, uh, longer term, there are some questions that I think reasonable questions about uh, NATO expansion after the end of the Cold War. Um, it's not unreasonable for Russia to see that expansion, including a number of former Soviet states joining NATO as potentially a threat to Russia. However, I am very skeptical that if the West had said, for example, okay, Russia, Ukraine will never join Russia, uh, Ukraine will never join NATO, we promise, that Putin would have said something like, oh, great, that's all we ever wanted, thank you. Um, it seems that where a lot of this is going back to 2014 during the Maiden Revolution when a uh, Ukrainian demonstrators got a pro-Russian president to resign. And ever since then, uh, that was uh, in response to that, that was when uh, Russia took Crimea um, and started uh, invading eastern Ukraine at uh, the beginning. Um, the first time they started doing that and encouraging separatists there. So it looks like uh, Putin has wanted a pro-Russian leader restored to Ukraine since 2014 and has tried a variety of ways to get it and has now decided to go with a military assault. And perhaps the most telling thing here was the speech that Putin gave publicly explaining the war to the Russian public, um, where he did not talk about NATO all that much. He did not claim, uh, he did not even make much of an argument about 
about the pretext that Russia is trying to push, in which they are lying about uh, Ukrainians in the East being subject to a genocide. Instead, what he argued primarily was what amounted to Ukraine's not a real country. The Soviet Union uh, should not have even uh, Vladimir Lenin should not have even drawn the map in such a way that said that Ukraine could be a real country. Um, and his tone and the things that he referenced made it seem like he thinks that Ukraine should be a part of Russia and was intent on conquest regardless. So while I wouldn't say the Western response was perfect, I think it was in the short term with threats of sanctions and disclosure of Russian activity and a unified diplomatic response was perhaps more unified, more forceful than Russia expected and was about as well as they could do. If Russia was determined to attack, there really wasn't much that anybody else could have done within the last few months to stop them.